Hello, everybody. Wonderful to have you all here for this free concert talk. Thanks for coming. This is a very exciting evening, hugely exciting because we're finally gathered in this extremely beautiful church, which I'll remind everyone is uh, situated and supported by the uh, unceded and traditional lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish nations. And uh, it's just extremely exciting for me to uh, be on the stage with our predecessor, my predecessor, Matthew White. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome Hello, to Vancouver. Hello, Susie. Hello, everybody. So Matthew and I are going to do a little chatting, but, but first I want to mention how special this evening is uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, one of them is just the fact that we're finally gathered together to listen to music live. Uh, another one is that all three directors of Early Music Vancouver that ever were, I think, are here this evening. So we have Jose Verstappen here. Yay! And Matt White and I. So, Matt, the last time, oh, and, and also, amazingly enough, it's our music director, the music director of the Pacific Baroque Orchestra, who is fittingly inaugurating this wonderful instrument tonight. So it's, it's a complete family. Um, so, Matt, I think the last time that you and I were sitting here on this stage was in 2019. The tables were turned. The tables were turned. You were interviewing me. <laughs> about, I think, Barbara Strozzi is what we were, That's right. we were doing. Yeah. yeah, I'm just actually going to take this off. Yeah, I'm freer now. Um, so, I mean, we're immensely grateful to you, Matt, for having had the vision and for having really made this whole wonderful new piano happen for Early Music Vancouver. It's really unique. I mean, there are not many instruments like this in North America or in Canada. No, indeed, yeah, and, and, and it is a unique, beautiful work of art. It's, it's exquisite um, and, and also fulfilling a very important missing piece in the instrument collection of EMV, right? Also true, yeah. yeah. So I thought it'd be kind of fun for me because I wasn't here then and for everybody who maybe doesn't know the story, how was the idea born? How does one decide as the director of Early Music Vancouver to buy a piano? <laughs> Well, I, I wish I could say it was my original idea, but it was Jose's idea. <laughs> um, and in fact, I, I was reading the the, um, the program notes tonight, and I recognized that it was a kind of a f hilarious fusion of both Jose and my writing style, um, because he had actually created an argument for getting a piece just like this um, a long time ago now. And and the basic argument is that, that um, early music and historically informed performance practice is kind of a philosophy, the idea being that if if you're going to perform music from any era, you want to use the right technology, the right piece of equipment. And that argument makes as much sense as it does in the 19th century, as it does in the 18th century, as it does in, in you know, whenever. So um, we just uh, realized that actually, for the most part, you know, we were doing 16th century, 17th century, 18th century music. And we weren't doing a lot of this music. And part of the reason was because we had a really key piece of our kind of infrastructure missing. And that was this instrument and I got on the bandwagon as it were when Jose started telling me to go and listen to a whole bunch of these forte pianists and how differently the way that they uh, played this music when on when when they played it on an instrument like this he, uh, he just said you, you got to hear how different it is and and so I started doing that and I think the recording that I that I noticed it the most in was a, a recording of the the orchestra of the 18th century playing um, Chopin's second piano concerto with a uh, an instrument that was roughly contemporaneous with this one. And for the first time, I thought, oh, Chopin's fantastic. <laughs> and I thought, why why do I feel this right now? And it was it was because there was something about the instrument and the balance with the rest of the orchestra that all of a sudden made perfect sense to me. I could hear the inner parts, I could hear the bass, I could hear the harmony in a way that I was not hearing before. And instead of feeling like it was the type of music that, that you know that was kind of lit writ large, I could hear every little change and, and I felt uh, all of a sudden really emotionally connected to it. So I thought, that's what we need. We need one of these instruments. And Jose was right, as he always was. Um, and I thought this would be a really wonderful project to, to undertake. It is. Uh, and 
We just heard Alex demonstrate uh, the instrument for some of the piano donors, uh, and thank you again to all the piano donors who donated to make this happen. But um, what I found was indeed incredible clarity in all the inner voices and a sweetness that is amazing, and that you can really think then that a, a, a wind instrument, a wooden wind instrument rather than a metal wind instrument would have a chance to, to be heard, and you can even imagine the top, top strings of this piano remind me of a, of a sweetness of the Baroque violin, so. A absolutely right, yeah. and, and I think it changes everything about the way a musician approaches it, and I, I, I sort of got excited about the idea of having an instrument like this in the community so that people who, had, who didn't have the experience could, could go and, and get a sense of just how different these instruments are and how the composers who are writing for them were gonna, were gonna obviously had a totally different sound world in mind and how inspiring that could be to people. And, and then we started thinking a little bit about, you know, what, so if we're gonna get an instrument like this, do we wanna buy uh, a, an original instrument or do we wanna buy a copy? And then that was a, a really exciting um, uh, discovery, basically, to figure out all of the different arguments why maybe getting a copy made more sense than getting an original. And, and to me, the, the most obvious uh, reason to start with was that in the 19th century, when they built these pianos, they were new. So the people were hearing new instruments at the time. They weren't hearing instruments that were 300 years old and that had been warped, for instance. And these instruments often do warp over time. Yeah, they don't, well, some of them survive very well, but not all of them. And they're not necessarily built to last 300 years and so, or 200, yeah. How did you choose the maker, Paul McNulty, basically? How did you make it your choice? Or maybe that was Jose's choice. <laughs> well, actually, no, what Jose um, had, had originally suggested that we work uh, with a guy called uh, Rodney Regeer, I think was his name, who was a, a builder in um, Freeport, Maine, who was very respected internationally for making these instruments. Um, but when we contacted um, Mr. Regeer, he said, I'm, I've got too long of a wait list. I, I can't put another piano on my list. And he said, I've got 10 years left and I've got 23 pianos or something that I've got to build. So it's not going to happen. So, so then at that time, he mentioned a bunch of names. Not a bunch. I should say th like three names. Um, and, and Paul McNulty was one of those names. And then he said, what I suggest you do is you make, you make a bunch of phone calls to the best players in the business and find out which instruments they love playing on. So I phoned uh, Malcolm Bilson. I phoned um, uh, Tobias Koch, who was here a few years ago for a recital of Chopin, if some of you might remember. And Christian Bezoidenhout is somebody I've known for many years. And all of them gave me the same three names. Hmm. And Paul McNulty was one of those names in each case. Um, so then I just started uh, doing the research in terms of, you know, who's got room, who's got time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Paul, his name just kept coming to the top of the list again and again. And it was actually Christian Bezoidenhout in particular who just said, and he sent me a bunch of videos of him playing another copy of the same instrument. And he said, mm. I, you know, this is really an extraordinary thing. And I think you couldn't go wrong to, to get him to build you one. Mm. And now we know that we didn't go wrong. It's, it's absolutely an exquisite instrument. Um, and um, I just want to talk a little bit about when it arrived. Um, that was very exciting. So it came from the Czech Republic by air, by cargo. And um, Nathan Lorch, our business manager, went with the, the uh, movers to pick it up. And when it arrived at Hudson, it had been in transit for about five or six days. They unpacked it, and it was perfectly in tune, which is amazing. Which is a good reason, another good reason to get a copy instead of an original, <laughs> right? Because they actually often have a, a lot less... Yeah. problems. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean, we have to say Paul McNulty has been building pianos for quite a few years, and every year he, them, he himself says how much better that everyone is. So he's very proud of this one, which is exciting. Yeah, that's what he said, too. He said they, they continue to make improvements, and I think, I think Paul McNulty has made over 200 forte pianos. I think he's made over 100 of, of roughly this this model, and every single time he continues to make improvements, and so uh, you know, and maybe they're just saying this because they just you know didn't want us to send it back, but but he just <laughs> this is the best one yet, you know. <laughs> the other thing which is new when you when you get an instrument like this, I mean, it it's not at all like a harpsichord, it's not at all like a modern piano, and you have to care for it, and you have to learn how to tune it, and I really just want to thank. 
uh, both Craig Tomlinson, who's somewhere here in the hall, there you are, and Scott Harder, who was actually tuning the instrument this evening, for their interest and their passion and their time and their devotion to this instrument. Uh, we had a, a Skype or a, a Zoom session with the uh, workshop in the Czech Republic with Viviana, uh, who's, who works in the workshop and who helps to build these instruments. And it was a fantastic session, you know, like Craig was amazing, you know, like taking off bits of the piano to show her things and <laughs> kind of taking out the keyboard to, to check things out and then making sure that we knew how to use the toolkit that came with the piano, which was pretty important. And, and since then, uh, both Scott and Craig have been tuning the piano, so we know that we can keep it in great condition. It's living in Hotson, which is our home in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing to have, particularly this last week when Alex was practicing hours on end and we were upstairs uh, in the office just enjoying hearing the piano. So it's extraordinary. So, and I, I guess, you know, I was just really realizing that one of the other things that's always been special about Early Music Vancouver is that it's, it's not just an organization that's about creating wonderful performances, it's about creating context for understanding music, right? About giving people a sense of the historical lines that, uh, and, and, and the, the broader cultural strokes that, that um, when you understand those things, you can enjoy the music more. And I, 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 one of the reasons that I thought it would also be interesting to have a, an instrument like this in the community is to provide um, access to students at the University of British Columbia or wherever else who are studying the piano to be able to sit down at one of these things and to better understand why the Schubert B flat is easier to play on this actually in certain respects. With is that a true? little practice With time, a little practice I think, time. That's it's a tough really piece, very, but very different. So I think at the beginning, uh, we did have some people come into the office who were modern pianists and, and felt a little bit lost actually Interesting. compared yeah. to playing the Broadwood, which is so much closer. The Broadwood is our... 1874 piano, which is an original, and that is much more acting like a modern piano. But this is a beast that takes a little uh, time to uh, get acquainted with, I hear. I'm sure that's true. What do I know as somebody, you know, can play <laughs> chopsticks or whatever, but I, 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 my, my impression though, and, and what I, I hope is that when uh, people get a chance to play an instrument that's in great shape, that, that, that maybe that it'll, it'll capture their imagination because that, that's the thing. I think you want to have a, a, a stable of instruments that are there for young people to, 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 to practice on and, and hopefully to be inspired by and then to make different musical decisions as a result. I hear you. Uh, I mean, we have now with the, the instrument that we have at UBC and our two pianos, we, we have the beginning of a collection that could actually lead to having a period... Uh, competition for, for historical pianos in Vancouver and and get young people to come here uh, as they prepare perhaps for the, the period competition uh, in Warsaw, the Chopin competition on period instruments. So it's all very exciting. Totally. And actually, you know, the, the Chopin Piano uh, Society here, um, I, I was given a gift before this whole thing got going and it was a, it was a beautiful book with photographs of um, a piano that had been built by Paul McNulty, which is a copy of the, the um, Buchholz piano, which is the piano that was defenestrated, that, that was thrown out of Chopin's window during the, the revolution before he went to France. And they decided as part of that, that competition that they would recreate this amazing thing. And they took all these amazing photos of him uh, uh, recreating this, this historical piano. They didn't throw it out the window as the final, <laughs> final copy. But. <laughs> Another great thing, and thank you for that, Matt and Jose, is that this piano is, is being heard tonight as a solo instrument, but it's endless what we can do with it in chamber music and in accompanying leader recitals, and it is just going to open up so many possibilities. Uh, I'm very excited about that, and, and may hopefully also bring uh, Canadian, young Canadian artists like Mélisande McNabb in Montreal, who's a forte pianist, and, and uh, collaborate with, with you know, world-renowned uh, musicians to, to play on this piano and, and the others. So, um, well, the other thing I think just to say is how unbelievably grateful I am to Alex Weiman, Alexander Weiman, um, for having agreed at one week's notice to give this recital tonight. It is absolutely amazing. <laughs> Uh, we are so lucky to have Alex living in Vancouver, an incredible musician who has uh, really had a lot of fun practicing on, on the new piano. 
And um, I also wanted to just uh, reassure people that Andreas Steyer, who was too ill to come, has been released from hospital this morning and is at home recovering and will be absolutely fine, but obviously not in time to come and play this concert. So um, I think maybe, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add. Um, no, just thank you for inviting me. It's, it's so, it feels very strange to be back, but also wonderful and it's so nice to see so many familiar faces. Yeah. I, I don't think we could have had this evening without you here, really. Thank you so much, Matthew, for making this happen. Let's just give him another round of applause. <laughs> and we will leave the stage, and uh, in a few moments, we'll welcome Alexander Weimann. Thank you so much. <laughs>